16 years later, we are finally playing a new Half-Life game from Valve, but this time in VR. Virtual reality games on PC have the reputation that you need a really expensive PC to enjoy that experience, especially with a high-end game like Half-Life Alex. And that is the conception that I wanted to challenge, so I put it to the test. I tested the game out on PCs that are just at the game's minimum requirements. And to talk about how that went, I'm joined by my friend and colleague, John Linneman. How are you doing there, John? I'm doing wonderful, Alex, while we're playing Alex. <laughs> and I tested the game on a very high-end PC, which is less relevant here, but I think it's it's an important thing to consider as we discuss this, because I think we both experienced the game in a different way. Yeah, I also played the game while sitting down. I've been a little under the weather recently, so I didn't want to be standing for all the duration of play, which was multiple hours at a time. Um, so I spent the game sitting, which is another type of way to, you can play the game. And I also played on an Oculus Rift, uh, the original model here. And you played on an S model, if I'm correct? Yes, that? that's right. I used the Rift S um, and I tested it on both, played the game standing up. And I found, you know, obviously being able to use room scale, mm -hmm. walking around, ducking down, you know, it does have a fundamental impact on the way you play the game. But I am happy to hear that it works well sitting down too. Definitely worked out pretty well. I mean, I got used to moving around even while sitting down, which was a weird, if you think about it, a brain leap to think that you're walking around while seated. <laughs> so it was pretty cool. I guess there was only slight problems now and then, like in terms of combat, where I didn't have the opportunity to duck down beneath cover. I could obviously lean in and out of cover, but I couldn't duck down. And there were some times where I was probably missing some collectible objects that were in like, like a chest of drawers uh, that is closer to the ground. I probably missed some collectible objects there. Being seated definitely worked 100%. I was playing through the game and enjoying it, but you are missing out on some of the more immersive experience by doing that. Yeah, like playing with the head crabs, like using a chair to sort of you know, fend them off. I don't know if you tried that seating, but it is, it's a very active and fun experience to play with those head crabs. <laughs> I did not do that, uh, but still a good time. Uh, let's talk about the minimum specs here though. The game says as a minimum, you need a Core i5-7500 or a Ryzen 5 1600. Now this is interesting because those are very different CPUs. <laughs> one is four cord and the other one is six cord, 12 thread. Uh, also with like very similar frequencies, like both in the three, four gigahertz range. I played the game on a Core i5-8400, which has six cores, so more than that 7500, but with a similar turbo frequency of 4.0 versus 3.8 there. Um, the game recommends 12 gigabytes of system RAM. I was playing on 16 gigabytes of system RAM at 2667 megahertz of DDR4 and I was on a SATA SSD. The big thing here is though, I was at the exact minimum requirements for the GPU, GTX 1060, and I also played it on an AMD RX 580. Uh -huh. Yeah, and the thing is, you're driving essentially a medium resolution screen for both of these, but you're having to draw the same scene more or less twice. So it's very heavy on the CPU and also as a result on the GPU as well because you're shading the scene twice. Yeah, so this is interesting because these GPUs in general uh, both auto detected different settings. I ended up going for medium settings across the board to have like for like between these GPUs. And I also turned off the high quality holograms option. Uh, interestingly though, the AMD RX 580 auto detected higher settings high settings actually, uh, in comparison to the medium detected for the GTX 1060. Huh. So actually that's interesting that it detects them as medium and high spec, uh, considering that those are like the lowest re recommended cards, or that's like the minimum requirements, right? So it makes you wonder like, what is the low setting designed for? Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll get to this later, but there's not actually a huge difference between the settings here, between the low and the ultra. But where there is a huge difference that's worth mentioning is that due to the nature of variable VR headsets in the market, each one has a different refresh rate. So like the Oculus Rift S is actually only 80 Hertz, but the low persistence display, it actually looks very clear and very comparable to the regular Rift, uh, which is 90 Hertz. But if you have something really high end, like uh, the Valve Index, for instance, that's either 120 Hertz or like 144 Hertz, I think on the top end. Uh, you know, so you, you basically, depending on the headset you're using, you're going to have to hit a higher target frame rate for smooth gameplay. And this is kind of important to remember if you're using the minimum spec cards. 
yeah, before I forget, uh, the way we measured performance here is by the game kicks out a zoomed in FOV replication of what you see in VR on one of your eyes. So it zooms it in and it's unwarped. So it looks actually a little bit grainier than what I actually see in the game. Uh, and that is actually aligns one to one with the amount of frames that are actually being produced by the GPU. Uh, so that kicked out screen that is unwarped and zoomed in you can overlay FCAT onto it or anything you really want and find out the exact performance it is. Obviously in the headset itself, there's asynchronous time warp that, which is working, which will give you a different subjective experience than the actual number of frames that are being put out by the GPU and CPU. So basically, I mean, the, the goal of that is a technology to smooth out head movement even at lower frame rates. So like, let's say your game is updating at 60 instead of 90, for instance, your head movement will still appear as if it's operating at the full 90 hertz uh, subjectively, but uh, the motion of the objects within the game world, like if you move your pistol in front of the camera view, will appear to update at a lower rate. So as long as you're hitting the target necessary for asynchronous time warp to function correctly, your head movement should appear smooth, which is really key to avoid motion sickness. Which is precisely what happened on both these GPUs on this CPU while doing most of the combat scenarios. There was not any moment while I was playing in combat where I thought, this is making me feel sick or something like that. Playing around and doing the combat scenarios of the game, which is most of the game. It's not uh, like elaborate cutscene scenarios or something like that. It follows the Half-Life style of where you go in a room and there's a cutscene that's playing where you can walk around while it's happening. Uh, but the most like actual general gameplay that you're playing around is like, you know, interacting with the environment, shooting zombies, uh, engaging in combat with the combine. That ran very well on both of these GPUs, like going around the 90 FPS line down to the 70s at worst. I would say down to a level of like 60 FPS, that asynchronous time warp works pretty well. It's obviously noticeably jittery, jitter -er. there's more judder <laughs> in the hand movements or in the animations of things around the screen, but your head can still compensate pretty well. So. That's what I saw in most combat, and you can see that here on screen as well. Both GPUs holding up really well in combat at medium settings. There were differences though. Um, like for like scenarios is really not easy to get because VR is constantly moving and you can't place yourself in the world exactly where you were always. But I could still run the same scenes. And I noticed that the GTX 1060 in this case seems to be just worse off in GPU limited scenarios where I would say there's either a lot of alpha effects getting close to the screen or there's just generally more complex shading going on. So like in the scene when the combine tell you to put your hands up, I noticed that as the, the scanner robot comes up to you and like does like takes your like image profile while the GTX 1060 dropping down to 50 FPS, which did not look and feel good actually. But once again, a non-interactive moment. And here the RX 580, which is less GPU limited, drops down to 62 FPS. So this is really interesting so far because it seems like uh, obviously the 1060 is struggling with some of those GPU heavy effects like alpha, but it seems like the real problem is these complex animated sequences uh, where you're like interacting closely with a model versus like during normal gameplay is what's really hammering the system. I think they budgeted the game in like different ways. So scenes where they knew you'd be doing any of like the normal, like I need to move intensely kind of uh, combat scenarios like where you're interacting with zombies or something like that they budgeted the scene so that it would have a more steady less gpu and less cpu intensive frame rate other cutscene areas like where you're talking with russell or kind of like when you interact with the resin machines which are like really heavy uh those see like cpu related drops in like say the hologram scene where i'm talking with russell here both GPUs are very much so CPU limited as this hologram's called up. Both drop down to 45 FPS, essentially, which is really brutal and does not look good, actually. Especially on the GTX 1060 huh. here, which I noticed was also like having like a really erratic frame time. Uh, so something is, is very CPU limited about these holograms that are brought up, or like the resin machine in the sewer, that is also CPU limited, where when you walk right up to it to put your gun into it after it brings up that little display both 
uh, GPUs here drop down to 45 FPS. And just since we know that the RX 580 should be running generally better uh, GPU wise in most scenes, it means that I'm CPU limited. That's so weird. It is jarring, I'll say that. Uh, like when that happens, I do notice it. I guess this game just requires a much better per core performance than a Core i5 8400 with very low end DDR4 can actually muster. I'd imagine if you have a highly overclocked Ryzen or a higher performing C CPU, like per core performance with much better memory speeds and like tighter RAM timings, you'll get much better performance here. And I, I can attest to that on my system where, you know, I'm using the i9-7960X, which is their 16 core, 32 thread CPU, uh, Skylake X. And then I also have, the, of course, the RTX 2080 Ti in there. I haven't had any issues in any of these scenes. And it didn't, never even occurred to me that things like the holograms would actually cause performance problems. So your numbers are really fascinating in that sense. But one of the issues, though, I guess here is that a lot of information on Source 2 that I could find to really understand the way it functions and like what's unique about the way certain things are rendered. So it's a little bit of a mystery for us right now. Part of the mystery too comes from the graphical options themselves, but we'll get to that later. But one of the things about performance that I do need to touch on is that obviously 45 FPS when I'm looking at this resin machine doesn't look very great, but as long as I'm staying within that asynchronous time warp window of dropping down by the, the refresh rate by one, uh, like one level, then it feels still actually kind of okay. And what I mean by that is if the games on my Oculus Rift is running at 90 hertz, that means each frame time for a perfect 90 FPS would be 11.1 .1 milliseconds repeating. Obviously, if it drops down one frame to like 89 FPS for a split second, the frame time will go down to 22.2222. And that actually feels pretty okay if that's happening rather often, like it's bouncing in between those two, like 11. 0.1, two, 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 and then goes back up to 11.1 .1 again. That feels fine. Asynchronous time warp can take care of that really well for your head movement. What it doesn't do really well is if it drops down from 11.1 .1 to 33.3 .3 or even lower. So it misses like double the refresh rate cycle. It, and then when you turn your head at those moments, you actually feel and see a visible judder in the world and it like stops for a split second. And since asynchronous time warp is doing some trickery, uh, you can actually see like a seam in the world for that one second while that's happening as well too. So it doesn't feel good. And I noticed this is one thing that I actually disliked about the experience on the AMD card is that happened more often for some reason. Huh. And I don't think it's a problem with the GPU. I think it's something Vulcan CPU related driver related maybe i have no idea i noticed that i was seeing that happening more often like a one-off runt frame dropping down to 33.3 ms instead of being 11.1 .1 ms 22 point ms and a more gradual drop from 22.2 ms to 33.3 ms and the key there though is that like this is so much more noticeable in vr like you know I do see frame rate drops anyways, but a lot of people struggle to say, oh, I didn't notice a single frame drop. But when you're in VR and the whole display sort of legs for just a split second like yeah. that, uh, it's extremely jarring. So I did want to try and claw back performance is what I wanted to do after having this entire experience of really good combat, but cutscenes not running that well always necessary. Here I thought problems could be CPU related. In the case on the GTX 1060, it would be memory bandwidth bound with things like holograms. But through all, all my testing of going through all these GPU settings, basically none of them had any real good effect on performance except for one. Like in the scene with Russell where he's talking to me and the hologram pops up, toggling the setting that would affect that, the hologram setting, high quality holograms, did absolutely nothing for performance in the scene. So it's very CPU limited. Or like going outside in a scene where I'm looking far into the distance, everything to ultra, so it was like in the mid 70s, dropping down the shadow settings did absolutely nothing. Hmm. So the shadow setting in this game, as I see it, not a, there's not a lot of real-time shadows. Most of it's baked. When, when you get close to an object, its shadow will gradually kind of render in. So the, the higher your setting is, like you go up to ultra, that will happen much further into the distance. So shadows will show up more in the distance. Also, their resolution will be higher on high and ultra than it is on low and medium. Turning this on and off in scenes where I'd imagine that would have a performance impact did not do actually much of anything at all. 
because there's once again not a lot of real-time shadows in this game where that is actually the limiting part of your performance. Your performance is probably most limited by like the general shading of the scene or really importantly volumetric lighting. On Ultra I saw going down to low 16 to 20 percent better performance in one scene just by toggling this down to low and since it is one of these frustum aligned voxel kind of volumetric lighting fog schemes going from down from high to low doesn't actually turn it off it just makes it less precise and it still fills every scene it's still pretty good looking the only thing is you may see like more like aliasing in motion on it as you walk towards it uh, but still like that's really the only option i saw that really affected gpu performance at all texture settings between low and ultra, they look the exact same. Huh. They, they seem to affect the GPU streaming. I, I'm not exactly even sure what the soft body setting does. It didn't turn off like the physics on um, the jackets you can touch in the game, which I thought would maybe be soft body physics or something like that. It didn't affect the fact that ragdolls are, are happen and move about. So, so what you really want is a CPU with very strong, well, I don't want to say single core performance, but you want yeah. each core to be able to handle its load very well. Like, it doesn't seem like it scales well. Yeah, it doesn't seem based upon these minimum specs and the fact that a six core is still dropping to these frame rates that I'm seeing here. I do not think it scales perfectly well with CPU cores. Rather, you want that fast memory and you really want good IPC performance. There's not a lot of actual performance you can claw back with these settings. But that also means if you play the game on medium or low settings, you're still getting a game that looks extremely comparably great. I was playing it and I was always wowed with the graphical uh, presentation, even on medium settings. And yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing because, um, I mean, this is going to be an expensive game for a lot of people to play. Yeah. Because obviously you need a capable enough PC, but on top of that, you have to invest a lot of money in the VR headset. and You don't want to do that only to find that it doesn't run well enough to be enjoyable because, as we said, the performance has a profound impact on how comfortable it is to play. So in this case, my recommendations for people watching this video and thinking about investing in VR, I'd recommend to have a CPU that has better per core performance than the one that I have, the Core i5 8400 with 2667 megahertz DDR4 RAM. So I would say have higher memory speeds and a general better per core performance. GPU wise, I actually think the RX 580 is pretty great in this game. Something a tiny bit more powerful on medium settings would put most scenes in the extremely comfortable category. Something like a GTX 1070 or an RX 590 or anything higher than that would be a pretty great GPU for something like the Oculus that is driving this game at 90 hertz. Yeah, and if you're using the Atari Jaguar VR prototype headset, <laughs> then you could probably get by with a GTX 750 Ti. But, <laughs> but in general, I just want to say, in spite of all these problems that I was saying about the game and its performance on this rig, I still had a great time in those combat scenarios, which is the bulk of the game. You know, of all the footage I have here, it's about 80%, 90% of the time when I'm playing the game because in VR, you don't move through the world in like the typical way you do in most games. You are much more slow and methodical because you want to find things. You want to interact much more slowly, learn the systems. And that 70 to 90 FPS that I constantly saw was really great. It's just, I think, CPU limited scenes were a bit distracting. Uh, but John, cool. thanks for talking to me about this. A bit long discussion in the end and not to the point always because this is not that easy to get performance comparisons with. It's a very subjective experience, oddly enough. Very different than our normal reviews, but thanks for talking with me. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, I was, you know, like I said, I've been playing on a high-end machine, so it's really interesting to learn how it runs on something closer to the minimum spec. And it seems at least like you can have a relatively good experience overall with a few hiccups here and there. Yeah, so... If you did enjoy this video and you found it informative to you, and maybe perhaps if you want to try out Half-Life Alex one day, what kind of PC you'll want, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, consider hitting that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out in these strange times that we live in, please consider supporting us on Patreon to get this content in the highest quality as a download. And if you want to talk to John or myself about Half-Life Alex and running it on your PC, Write a comment below or follow John and myself on Twitter. And this is Alex bidding you all fidazin. Good job. Keep playing VR, I guess. Keep VR alive. Okay.